evening. Welcome to the British Library, um, or our temporary home, at least for tonight, over here at the Shaw Theatre, while our own theatre is, uh, is out of action. But we've got much more space here, so great to see you all here. Congratulations on your impeccable taste in choosing to join us, either in person or watching online from wherever you may be around the world. My name's John, I'm, I look after the events program for the library. Uh, tonight's event is supported by the Eccles Center for American Studies at the British Library and also by the US Embassy who approached us a few months ago saying, thanks to our great relationship with the British Library, we'd like to facilitate uh, a speaker coming from the US uh, to speak at the, in, uh, the British Library. So we decided, what about John Ronson? Uh, <laughs> And, and they were only too pleased, so it was absolutely fine with us. And, uh, and of course, he lives there, he talks about America, he is, he is not fully American, as you'll find out in a minute, but uh, he certainly has a good insight. So it's all, we're all good, we're all good with him being an American speaker. So, um, as I say, online, tonight we have, we have your people online, later on you'll have the chance to put your questions, and if you are watching online, uh, you have a little form below the video window, you can put some questions in there, we'll try and get to some of those as well. After the event, John's going to be outside signing books, there's no le less than seven titles out there, so you know, plenty to choose from, uh, so decide now which one you like the best, if you can. Uh, so they'll be out there, there's, uh, the event, as I say, is going to be about an hour and a half, about an hour of conversation and then questions. John will be joined on stage by, of course, by Miranda Sawyer, who is one of our finest uh, broadcasters and cultural journalists. She reviews uh, radio for The Observer. She's often on The Culture Show, on Radio 6. You, you've probably come across her many times. Uh, she's also an author, and her third book, uh, Long Term, is coming out next year. So they're good friends, and we were only too delighted to, to pair up Miranda and John again tonight. I think that's it from me, so please welcome to the stage John Ronson and Miranda Sawyer. <laughs> everyone, nice to be here. I'm Miranda, as you may have guessed. This is John. Um, I have an introduction for John, which I always think we should start with a nice introduction and then we're going to get into the chat. Here it is. Um, John Ronson, le voila, is a journalist known for many things. His perceptive writing, his inquisitive presenting, the fact that he was a keyboard player in Frank Sidebottom's band. Yay! <laughs> but mostly he's known for his ability to hang out with the kind of people that many of us dismiss as unpalatable, even scary, and to not only reveal such people as complicated human beings, but also, in so doing, skewer their power. He's written many excellent books, including Them, The Psychopath Test, and So You've Been Publicly Shamed. He's written a couple of fab films, Frank, Okja. Did you say Okja? Okja. Okja. And uh, more recently, he's made some great podcasts, such as The Butterfly Effect, and his recent BBC podcast, Thinks Things Fell Apart. He lives in New York, as we know. And uh, he's here to talk a bit about that, a bit about conspiracy theories, a bit about porn, and a bit about what he's working on at the moment. So let's do another round of applause for John. <laughs> okay. So, um, given this is an American-British evening, should we talk about your move to New York? Yeah, I moved to New York ten years ago in last August. Mm -hmm. For no reason, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, like, like John Kennedy said, sometimes you do things because they're hard. Uh, and uh, yeah, we went on the, we went on the Queen Mary too. Uh, Why did you not fly? Because of our dogs. We couldn't ah. put the dogs. So instead of like 18 hours of like complete hell in the baggage hold of a plane, they had eight days of semi hell. They <laughs> fucking in these kennels. Uh, and we were allowed to be with the in, in the kennels with the dogs for like 10 hours a day. Uh, and it was on the dark side of, of, the, of the ship, like, so it was always cold and it was like, Rrr, and we were just like all sitting with our dogs and freezing for like 10 hours a day with little flasks. This is terrible. I know, and I've got a picture. Can, we, can you switch to my slides? Uh, thank Whoa, you. Oh, there we go. Whoa. Yeah, because um, on the last day, we discovered that there was another dog on the Queen Mary 2. And this other dog had permission to sleep in its owner's bed. Oh, my God. Yeah. And do you know who this other dog was? Pudsey. <laughs> <laughs> the winner of Britain's Got Talent 2012. Well, 
I mean, I'm surprised he didn't have his own bed, let alone his like owners. Uh, I was, uh, and I've, I've voted for Pudsey twice. <laughs> it was, a, it was so dispiriting. It was like Pudsey was sailing to New York like a fucking king. <laughs> Pudsey, Pudsey was Kate Winslet, and Floppy and Josie were Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. He looks very pleased with himself, doesn't he? Well, that's the thing. Like, it, all my confidence shattered. And I thought, and that, when I got into New York, I felt like, it was like, I thought, in London, like, back in London, I was pudsy. Like, I'm, <laughs> I, could, I could walk like a human. And here, <laughs> and here in New York, all my confidence is gone. Oh, he was having a nice time. But that was a, that's a, it sounds like it's a slightly unsalubrious way to arrive in New York then. Yeah, and it was actually, it was a bit of a miserable first year. I mean, any, on any, you know, everybody knows that moving to another place is just the hardest thing you could do, even if you do it with all the privileges, so. And why was it hard? Because you kind of, like, one would assume, you know, you're a writer, you know, you obviously you speak English, you know, you, you've done a lot of work in America. Why was it bad when you first got to New York? I don't know, I found myself, like, oh, just bad me being inside my own head shit you know I, I I was isolating and just felt homesick I remember like I remember like I got offered 800 pounds to do a show in London and I said yes like it cost me about two and a half grand to get there <laughs> um and uh yeah and I was very homesick and I and I really missed but out of that actually came I don't think I'd ever written so you've been publicly shamed if that hadn't happened and what kicked it off then well, I'd just, you know, I'd go online and I'd see people being piled in on. And, and it wasn't that nobody was, it was so new, you know, pile-ons were so new that everyone was just excited about them. And nobody was really thinking through the ethics of it. And the slide, actually, like it started off with us getting corporations that had, you know, LA Fitness. Uh, the first great shaming that I remember was LA Fitness. Has anybody been on Twitter since like 2008? I remember this. <laughs> I there have. Were, yeah, there was a heavily pregnant woman who wanted to cancel her LA Fitness membership and they wouldn't let her. So we just went for them. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, we tasted blood and then we got like, you know, politicians who transgressed. And then, you know, uh, and then we got too excited about our shaming powers. And, and so we started just like shaming, like a day without a shaming felt just like a boring day, like, you know, like a day picking fingernails. So instead of getting powerful people who had actually transgressed, we moved to like private individuals who had misspoken. Yeah. And I was watching this unfold, and because I was feeling a bit miserable in New York, and I was like, so, and this woman, Justine Sacker, who was like the kind of ground zero of public shaming, I just looked at her, her night, um, and just thought, here's somebody else failing in New York. So I found myself like identifying more with her than, and that's, that was, I think that's why I wrote the book. And now it seems incredibly prescient, doesn't it? I mean, that almost seems like this is, it's not entirely the motivation of the internet, but the internet does that all the time now. That's, the, that's what everybody's tiptoeing around, isn't it? You can't yeah. say the wrong thing in case you're publicly shamed. Yes. You know, that's a quite a, it's uh, well, going to move that way, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, what happened was we, <clears throat> I think the other thing that happened, I'd just written The Psychopath Test, and, and that book, I think, taught me to be, you know, to, to understand human beings as kind of complicated, yeah. manifold, you know, a, a mess, you know. That taught me that human beings are a mess. You know, we can't be slotted into a checklist. Yeah. Where we're good and we're bad, we're clever and stupid. Yeah. We're grey areas. And just when I was coming to that... Rev and the best way to treat humans is with curiosity and empathy and patience and compassion. And I was coming with all these like, revelationary thoughts after 20 years of being more hierarchical, like going into situations and being a little bit, you know, a yeah. little finger waggy. Oh, yeah, and, OK, uh, yeah. So, so then you, kind of, you, were, you were understanding that people might be com com more complicated. And a different way for, for non-fiction people to regard our fellow humans. And, and while I was coming up with that thought, uh, at the same time, social media was coming along with the opposite thought, yeah. that what was really valuable was, was cold, instant judgment. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, you know, when you fill your head with cold, instant judgment, there's no room for curiosity and empathy. And in fact, social media punishes. I mean, social media is empathetic, but it's, a, it's a, like a highly selective empathy. Yeah. And, it, and it punishes curiosity. The night of Justine Sacco, which was... Uh, did people remember that night? Uh, mm. Uh, it, she tweeted, she was like the ground zero, like the typhoid Mary of public shame. <laughs> and uh, on her tweet, she was about to go to Cape Town. I've actually, oh. It's so long, isn't it? You want to say, can you do it short? Um, 
No, let's not do this. Yeah. Bring the night down. But yeah. basically, she tweeted, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. And then yeah. she got on the plane and, like, fell asleep. And while she was asleep, Twitter took control of her life and just mangled it. Yeah. Um, if, uh, and, uh, and the reason why I bring that up is because um, anybody who said, can we just wait for her plane to land, which, they were piled in on too. We don't need to wait for a plane to land. We, we know already what she's know like. that she's bad. Yeah. Yeah. So she'd been tried, convicted, and punished, sentenced while she was asleep and oblivious. And and the fact that she was oblivious was hilarious to people. Yeah. We were create. It was torture. When I wrote the Menesteric Goats, I discovered this torture technique called the Buka effect, which is basically equivalent to somebody jumping out in front of you in the dark, and you like, and you go, ah, and then you realise it's your wife. And the American torturers say, if you can capture that moment of ah before your brain settles down, that's the gold standard of torture techniques, the holy grail. <laughs> and I think what we were doing with Justine Sacker that night, while we were waiting for a plane to land was like the holy grail of torture techniques. A million yeah. people just standing in the shadows waiting to jump out and say boo. Yeah, yeah. goodness. It's, uh, yeah, it is terrible. I mean, it's interesting with public shame because, you know, as you said, what you did was you started to understand that there's a different way perhaps to approach, um, you know, non-fiction subjects. And, I mean, one, one of the things that you did after publicly shamed was you made... Um, the butterfly effect. And the interesting thing about the butterfly effect, which is an amazing podcast about porn, is that you, it starts off with a situation where you see a woman in a hotel bar mm. and she's being disdained, isn't she? Yeah. She's being absolutely disdained, simply, be, you know, she's just a woman in a hotel bar, but because of what <coughs> she looks like and who she is, she's yeah. disdained. Well, I, well, I tell, well, I tell the story very briefly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a woman called Princess Donna Delure. And she was a, a porn performer and impresario and dominatrix. And I was meeting her. I, I thought I'd try to do something about porn and shame and how porn performers use, you know, filter their shame by turning it into pornographic scenarios. And I thought that might be kind of interesting. So, so I approached her. And yeah, my first ever porn performer meeting. And I was at a fancy hotel where everybody was dressed like me, like, you know, James Purse. And um, they phoned and said, you know, your guest is waiting for you downstairs. So I went downstairs and, you know, everyone was dressed in like hoodies and this, except for Princess Donna, who was dressed like a kind of great mad peacock and, and very, you know, high heels and very tight dress. And I was walking towards her and I looked over at the receptionist and he was looking at her and, I, and the look on his face was of total contempt. Mm. And I thought, I bet you don't feel that way about her when she's on your laptop. <laughs> and so that was the moment, really, that gave me the... I sort of stored that, and, and, and that became, I guess, two years later, the starting point of the butterfly effect. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, again, a kind of feeling of contempt for another human being for kind of somehow straying over a line that isn't even articulated. Yeah, yeah. It's not allowed. Yeah, he just he felt more comfortable when she was safely on his laptop than in his vicinity. Yeah. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about the lives of porn stars. So I started, uh, you know, I started approaching porn directors. And I, and I was on the set, my, my, uh, my, my kind of eureka moment was on the set of Stepdaughter Cheerleader Orgy. <laughs> where Seminal work. <laughs> right. The director, Mike Quasar, just happened to say... Yeah, you know, when I started out in porn in the 90s, our films weren't called things like that. And I said, what were they called? He goes, well, they were called um, Women of Influence or The Billionaire's Blonde. <laughs> and I said, well, why are they now called Stepdaughter Cheerleader Orgy? And he said, because we need to load our titles with the most searched for terms. It's all it's search engine optimization. Yeah. And those are the most searched for terms. And, and now everything's about SEA yeah. or SEO. SEO, yeah. Um, so like I hashtag, really, isn't it? Yeah. So I said, so are there people who, <clears throat> are there people in porn who like aren't easily searchable and then slip through the cracks? And he said, yes. If you're a 23 year old woman in, in porn now, you can't get work because you're too old to be a teen and too young to be a MILF. 
So I was like... Well, that's very young, isn't it? <laughs> to be, like, I know. You know, to be waiting to get older. Well, that's what I said. Like, so what do they do while they sort of sit there and sort of wait, wait to become a MILF? Like, what do they do during those, like, fallow years between teen and MILF? <laughs> Um, I've often wondered. <laughs> I, I did think, like, the 23-year-old porn star is a little bit like the political moderate on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and the answer was customs. And I said, what's customs? And he said, well, look, if you've always wanted to see a porn film that is so bizarre, nobody would ever think to make it, now you've got like all these professional porn people in their mid twenties who are just looking for work. So you can you can commission porn performers to make a porn film just for you. Uh, Everyone. Yeah. You can commission porn performers to make a film just for you. So I then went on an odyssey to try and find like the best <laughs> customs porn, and I've got a couple of clips. If anybody would like to see, yeah. they? they're great. I've seen yeah. them. They're very good. Will I, will I show you the? Um, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're PG rated. They are. It's all right. It's okay. I didn't want to cause any difficulties. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you a couple of clips of bespoke porn. <laughs> uh, so the first one is um, Condiments Man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh. It's like curry. <laughs> The, we know one thing about Condiments Man, which is the fact that he's a restaurateur <laughs> who presumably deals with condiments all the time and has to make sure that this stuff doesn't happen in his restaurants. Oh, oh it's so cold and slimy. <laughs> and then there's Fly Swatter Man. Some of them are crazy because they're just so normal. Yeah, the fly swatter. Oh, yes, the fly swatter. He wanted, wanted to watch a girl swatting flies. She remains fully clothed throughout the entire video, and she's getting frustrated because there's flies everywhere. Oh my gosh, got another one. I couldn't help wondering what had happened in this man's life to... Uh... <laughs> Maybe he watched his mom swat flies? Ooh. <laughs> but probably so. <laughs> oh, yes! <laughs> And I've got, I've got one more, I've got one more clip, um, and it's Stamps Man. And um, Stamps Man is, is fabled. Um, so this is a mysterious man from Norway who um, has, um, he's got very expensive stamp collection, 10 books of them, and he sends one at a time to different bespoke porn performers and wants them to destroy his priceless stamp and collection. And they're, I mean, worth unbelievable amounts of Yeah, a lot of money. So I've got a little clip from Stamps Man. He has had this stamp collection for 40 years, and we just accepted it and burned it. <laughs> That's just my boyfriend's stamp collection. <laughs> stamp collection? Oh, oh my God! God. <laughs> yes, 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 keep going, keep going, twist. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm going to know you're about to see them burn the stamps too. Here we go, there you go, in the fire. They said that they were wondering whether to... Um, yeah, so I got obsessed with Stamps Man and eventually we tracked him down to Norway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, did he explain? He explained why. Yeah, he did. But what just popped into my mind was I was I was meeting a bespoke porn producer, and I said to her, "Have you ever uh, had had a mysterious man send you their book of stamps for you to destroy?" And she said, "Are you stamps man?" <laughs> Imagine. He could have just said yes. I'm trying to remember like what his inner life, what happened in his inner life to make that happen. I, I, he was a big stamps fan and he used to go to the big stamp stores where all the intellectuals would meet and discuss, you know, these things. I know what they're all doing now. Yeah. They're all like writing nice tweets to Elon Musk, it's the same kind of crowd. <laughs> um, and then the stamps, the internet came and the stamp stores closed down and he got he got depressed and lonely, but carried on his collection. And he went to see a therapist, and his therapist said to him that stamp collecting is a ridiculous hobby. Uh, oh, no. Because it, it'll isolate you and it'll make you lonely. And that's why he started sending his stamp collection to porn stars to destroy. That's quite interesting, though, because you could just, I mean, you could destroy them yourself. But obviously, he cares about them so much that he's then elevated them into a kind of, well, like, I suppose, a sexual 
object? Well, apparently destroying valuable things is a well-known fetish. Okay. Not what I have. I say keep hold of your valuable yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, that's Especially like, yeah. now with, you know, climate change. Yeah, you, you know, could just you... give them to a charity shop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You could do that. Yes. And how did, when you, when you did the, um, the porn, when you did uh, Butterfly Effect, which was the porn, the, the porn series that resulted from that, that you ended up, you know, knowing about this. Um, how did that, I mean, what did you, you know, it's a bit of a weird question, but what did you learn from that? Because it was a, it was a very interesting thing that you found out, really, was how porn had changed. Oh, yeah, because of Fabian. Uh, yeah. Basically, it's all to do with, well, I mean, I, I kind of think the butterfly effect, in a way, is a kind of metaphor for tech utopians and the tech takeover of all the different industries from uber through to everything else and just this giant flow of money basically this guy fabian this you know young austrian guy had an idea which was to give the world youtube for porn like free porn yeah. and just overnight there was this vast flow of money from from the san fernando valley into fabian's pocket so much money i had no idea what to do with it like he he, he in the end he built himself an aquarium that was so big it needed its own diver. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas the porn performers were like struggling and having to... So I think the reason why I like that show is because I like turning... I like turning like who we're supposed to like and who we're not supposed to like on, on, on its head. Yes, it's interesting as well because I think also people might assume about a kind of podcast about porn and if it's presented by somebody like you that it's like in that style where you mm, quizzically turn up yeah. to a porn shoot and like, ooh, what are they doing here? Which is like a kind of, a, I suppose, a kind of trope of investigative journalism. Yeah. That you were really trying to do something different from that. Oh, yeah, we made our excuses and left. I mean, what a load <laughs> of bollocks. Uh, <laughs> and it reminds me of a story in So You've Been Publicly Shamed about this vicar in North Wales who, uh, who um, was having these little orgies in a caravan and people would meet in the pub and like four people turned up and two of them were undercover reporters from the news of the world yeah and but this story ends badly i'm sad to say and and the the, the thing that i remember most of all was there was a little sign at the pub so just in case anybody else would turn up it was like caravan 2.3 miles that way oh that's anyway the, the news of the world people um revealed themselves and he said, I'm the vicar, you know, if you publish this, I'll kill myself. And, of course, they published and he, and he did. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. That's like the, that is the element of publicly shamed, isn't it? Well, yeah. But, you know, when, when on Twitter we hate tabloids, yet we act like them. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Yes, I think that is very true. Um, when, we, when we think about your career, because obviously it started... You know, a, a long time ago. <laughs> it just started a long time 35 ago. Thirty-five years. And by the way, one of my very earliest adventures was with Miranda. That's true. <laughs> we uh, we went to a sex cult in we France. We did. I was only on holiday. <laughs> 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 I just uh, I was on holiday by myself, which sounds a bit weird, but it's true. And I and I got in touch with John, and I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Oh, I'm going to see a sex cult. Do you want to come along?" And I went, "All right, fine." <laughs> yeah. So we went into this sex cult. They were called the Raelians. Uh, they hit the headlines a couple of years later for for falsely claiming that they'd cloned the first baby, baby human yeah. baby. Uh, and there was a big kerfuffle about it at the time. But my big memory of that day was that they, they were pretending that they weren't a sex cult and what they actually were were a UFO cult. <laughs> uh, but, and I was there with like a crew and Miranda and they were just, all they wanted to do was have, I don't know if you remember it this way, but they just yeah. all wanted to have sex with each other <laughs> and they couldn't until we left. <laughs> And they were getting like more and more pissed off about it. Yeah, we were unwanted guests. We were we? so unwanted. <laughs> they were like sitting there by the pool, just like, you yeah. know, basically just desperate to have an orgy. Yeah. And we were just wandering around taking cutaways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. But that's, I mean, what's funny about that really is that, that, that you've always been interested in these outsider things. Yeah. But you, you, your technique is changed i would say so perhaps in those days it was a bit more like we made our excuses and left you so it was more like oh these are quite funny hmm, what we did exactly and like, i think you've changed now haven't you yeah defining the boundaries of normality by mocking the people on the outside of it yeah that i guess that was uh, i want to go as far as to say that was my beat back then but i would <laughs> say i was veering a little too close to that yeah um i, you know, I, I, I grew up admiring the gonzo journalists and the new journalists and there certainly was a distance between the writer 
you know, Hunter S. Thompson and yeah. all of those, and P.J. O'Rourke. And so, yeah, I, I, I wanted to, like, go to the shadows. And I did want to be a little... Well, I wanted to go to, like, really scary people and be funny. Yeah. I was also really inspired by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, yeah. So I wanted, like a, like, a collision of comedy and horror. I think more than mocking people, that's what I wanted. I wanted a kind of Vonnegutian, and, like, absurdist comedy, which often includes writing about the kind of absurd aspects of people's characters. Yeah, and also perhaps, I mean, it reveals a kind of banality of some really terrifying people, doesn't it, mm. if, you're, if you are funny about it? Well, like... Uh, In real life, oh, these oh, girls... sorry, like Omar, that's, uh, that was my first adventure. Yeah, there's oh. Omar. Yeah, that's Omar Bakri Mohammed. Yeah. Who announced that he wouldn't rest until he saw the flag of Islam flying over Downing Street. And then he, he outed me as a Jew at his jihad training camp in Crawley. Uh, bit unfair. I spent a, I spent a year with him. He said, uh, John, I have given you much. I, I would, I've let you in my life. Can I have something in return? And I said, what? And he said, can you drive me to Office World? And so I became like a chauffeur for about <laughs> six months. <laughs> Drove him into like a secret terrorist meeting in Birmingham and then Office World. And then Office World because of their special price promise. So he was like using <laughs> capitalism to destroy it. Um, and then eventually he kind of outed me. And there was a moment actually when uh, he was, we were at Office World and like he was getting Crush the Pirate State of Israel pamphlets done. And next to him was a rabbi getting sheet music for a bar mitzvah. And the two of them are like standing there, and, and there's a long shot of the two of them standing there. And then Omar just turns to, turns to me and goes, very sensitive moment. <laughs> 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 and then, yeah, he outed me as a Jew. He took me to his jihad training camp in Crawley and said, look at me with the infidel John, who is a Jew. And they all went, <gasps> And I said, well, surely it's better to be a Jew than an atheist. And I heard someone go, no, it isn't. <laughs> um, I, the thing is, I am basically an atheist, so I don't know why, of all places, to suddenly, like, declare my Jewishness. I choose <laughs> jihad training camp in the middle of a forest in Crawley. <laughs> I suppose you're just reclaiming it. Like, yes, yeah. I am, I'm bigger. Uh, and how did that go after then? Uh, after you know what, it went well. Uh, they, uh, they all... <laughs> They all, like, this is probably 96, I think, and then they all, like, surrounded me and asked me loads of questions. Like, what is, I've never, I, mem I clearly remember one of them saying, I've never met a Jew. Like, you know, tell me about it. And we had a big chat, and I left thinking, well, I, I fear I've solved the problem. Yeah, <laughs> everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and now, like, loads of them have became suicide bombers. Like, a, 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 a surprising number of... Of the pe people that you've met? Yeah, or the, certainly the people who went through that particular scout hut, that jihad training camp, wow. went on to become... And Omar ended up in jail for inciting terrorism in Lebanon. Yeah. I mean, that's, what, that's the weirdness of it, though, isn't it? If you're kind of exposing, in inverted commas, the banality of all the... Yeah. You're not the incompetence, but the kind of everyday nature of it. <laughs> then do you like make them seem less? Or do you, are you like doing a disservice? Yeah. Oh. Or, or you, are you not allowing for the fact that people can be completely uh, kind of banal and almost boring, but then also harbour kind of other terrible kind of t terrible yeah. desires and terrible, um, you know, wants for, uh, for violence. Well, I think that's just, that was just the truth about Omar Bakri. He was yeah. absurd and silly and, and, you know, there was, there was comedy, but, and he was also capable of inspiring people to do acts of terrorism. Yeah. Those two things live concurrently within him. I mean, you know, I lived in, yeah. And that's quite interesting because actually, the, you know, one assumes... I mean, so you do sometimes meet people that you just think, whoa, you, you know, terrible, terrible vibe off your just edge over here. Yeah. But, like, um, mostly people contain both, don't they? I mean, you know, we contain, like... You know, this is a, obviously a kind of Christian idea, but you contain, like, God and the devil within you. And we're, we're perhaps taught to think that just you would be able to identify somebody as being terribly bad because they would kind of, you know, have horns or whatever. And, you know, you'd be able to see by, the, by, the, by the, their very nature that that's who they are. But a lot of your journalism is about saying that's not true. Yeah. I mean, it just... I don't know. It just feels like it's a better way to chronicle and, you know... Regard it's honest, more humans. honest as well. Yeah, you know, and then you see on Twitter it being a kind of stage for constant artificial high drama where everybody's either, you know, a magnificent hero or a sickening villain. Yeah. And it's just not true. And we all know it's not true. I mean, I do know that I, you know, skate with Omar, with the, these early stories, I guess you skate, a, you, you skate them on quite thin ice because yeah. they are like properly dangerous people. And, and um, 
But I still think it's like ultimately better to just do these rounded, humanist, complicated, grey area portraits. Yeah. And silly. And but in those early days, it was just silly and funny. That's me with the, that's me with the Ku Klux Klan. That's a Klan <laughs> puppy. <laughs> And they're puppies. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was a politically correct faction of the Ku Klux Klan that had banned the robes and the hoods right. and the cross burning. So basically it was like the Ku Klux Klan but without the kind you of... You had the fun. Yes, I was going to say. <laughs> the bits that you... The party elements. Yeah. I mean, if I was in the Klan, those were the bits. Especially the cross burnings. I mean, God, yeah. there'd be so much like big bonfire. <laughs> uh, but no, they weren't like... They, they could do one cross burning a year. And they were so um, rust, like rusty, they couldn't remember how to do it. They were all standing around the cross, <laughs> debating whether to soak it in kerosene and then raise it, or raise it and then soak it. And, <laughs> and then the leader came over, Tom Robb, and he said, Tom, do we soak it and then raise it, or raise it and then soak it? And he said, do you soak it and then raise it? How are you going to soak it after you've raised it? And then he like, looks at me and said, like, and basically gave me a look to say, I'm sorry that my clansmen are such idiots. <laughs> Uh, Tom Robb definitely, uh, definitely identified more with me than with the clans yeah, uh, and wanted to impress me. Yeah, and, and um, my funniest memory of being with them, though, was that they, they, he had an idea to get the clansmen to do multiple choice questionnaires about which strengths and weaknesses most apply to them. Okay. And one of them was uh, mixes easily, <laughs> which, <laughs> like, normally... <laughs> would be a strength, but if you're in the clan... It's like absolutely it's a disadvantage. A weakness. <laughs> yeah. Also, another one was warrior. Warrior. And one of the clansmen thought it said warrior. <laughs> and Tom Robb was like, it's a weakness. And the guy was like, no, it's not. <laughs> I think being a warrior is a strength. And he's going, no, I think being a warrior is a weakness. So that was a funny misunderstanding. <laughs> Um, and how, I mean, how was that for you in that? I mean, again, it's a weird environment for you to go as a Jewish person. Not only a Jewish person, but now I look at that picture, someone who looks very fucking Jewish. <laughs> 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 and, and, yeah, there I was in the clan. They asked me at one point if I was Jewish I went, uh, on my third trip. But the, uh, uh, and I said no. But I was actually, I was going to tell them on my fourth trip, and then we realised we'd had enough. We had enough, we didn't need to do a fourth trip. Right, so did you just write a letter and I said, sorry, I forgot to mention? The, the, no, I just didn't, I, I didn't feel I owed the clan that. <laughs> <laughs> they felt that they owed me something, though, which was that when it was finished, he wrote me a letter. I promise I didn't ask for this. I've still got it. He wrote me a letter saying, to whom it may, con to whom it may concern, <clears throat> I have just been filmed by John Ronson, and I would like you to know that it was a wonderful experience, and if you're considering being filmed. Please take this as a letter to say, you know, I recommend. Sincerely, Tom Robb, Grand Wizard, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Amazing. Have you ever used it? Here's my I qualifications. <laughs> I went to Aryan Nations at the same time and they asked me if I was Jewish and that was much scarier. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, because um, they were like scary skinheads who wanted to kill me. And so you said no. Well, they said, what's your genie? I, I drove up the drive past all these signs that said like, no Jews. Jews turn back now. Whoa. Stop if you're Jewish. <laughs> and I was like, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know when you're in, when you're gathering and when you're gathering material, you just you're not thinking. Yeah. Um, and anyway, they all surrounded me and said, "What's your genealogy?" It was that was their words, and I said, "I'm Church of England." <laughs> and then a guy said, "Oh, made a joke about Church of England," and they all relaxed. And I think he might have been like an undercover agent. Ah. Saving my skin. Well, well interesting, yeah, yeah. maybe. Yes, it's, it's actually another situation where it's just all journalists. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> well, they, well, you know, the, you know the Gretchen Whitmer kidnap plot, right? Where where a bunch of you know young men were um, arrested for plotting to kidnap the governor of Michigan, and it turned out that like twelve of them were undercover agents or informants. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Mm. So, look, one of the things that you did at, around that time, one of your early. Um, works was um, actually hanging out with Alex Jones, who's incredibly, I suppose, do we say famous, infamous? I mean, yes. known? Yeah, well, now he's the world's most nefarious, unwell-known, unpowerful... Conspiracy, conspiracy theorist, yeah. yeah. Talk show host. Yeah. I met him back in the 90s. Yeah. And what was he like then? I mean, exhausting. He's, a, he's an energy vampire, I'll tell you that. Oh. Um, 
I've That's never... That's inviting to your dinner party. I've <laughs> never known anyone so energetic in my life. Like you'd spend 10, 12 hours with him and you'd be like crawling off to your room and then he'd phone you and ask you to come back because he had something <laughs> else that he wanted you to do. Wow. And was it, you know, it's quite fashionable now for everybody to be, to diagnose, self-diagnose themselves as ADD or ADHD. Do you think he was like that or? No, he's got, well, he was diagnosed by a court as having narcissistic personality disorder. Oh, so slightly different. Yeah, which I think actually, I, I think that like solves a lot of mysteries because... People always say, does Alex Jones, Alex, yeah, does Alex Jones believe it? Does he not believe it? And I think the answer is, if you're, if you're a narcissist, if you've got a pretty severe case of narcissism, it kind of doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. You want to be the smartest person in the room, and sometimes the, the way to do that is to come up with counterintuitive information that no one else has, like a conspiracy theory. So maybe we're asking the wrong question. It's just like it's a different worldview. Yeah, and it's also in a tension i mean you know an narcissist wants a, a, attention so it doesn't really matter if it's true or false it's just i'm saying something and you're looking at me yeah totally so we had this early adventure where i, I heard that um there was a secret club in the redwood forests of northern california called bohemian grove where world leaders have a ritual that culminates in a human effigy being thrown in a bonfire in front of a giant stone owl so I thought, well, that can't be true. I thought, well, you, you just thought, that sounds fun. <laughs> well, I thought, I want to try and get in. Um, but I don't want to do it alone. So I'll ask Alex Jones. And why did you ask him? Um, well, I asked David Icke first. And he said no, because that's where they transform themselves back into giant reptiles. So he was like, mm -mm. Yeah, he said, I'm staying away. He said, people go missing in those forests. Right. And then I, then I asked Alex Jones, because we'd met him a year earlier. He was rebuilding David Koresh's church at Waco. Wow. Yeah, with listener donations. He was like a local talk show host then. And he was clearly like, like most conspiracy talk show hosts in the 90s were so boring. They've just been like a public access TV show talking about the all-seeing eye on top of the dollar bill, just droning on. Yeah. And then Alex Jones came along and he was like mesmerising. I mean, mesmerising. And um, why, why was he mesmerising? Just brilliant at what he does. I mean, just, just the, his oratory skills, his imagination i mean you know it goes without saying he uses it for very bad ends and increasingly bad as he got older not so bad when i knew him in the 90s but he was clearly like going places i've got a little clip of just yes yeah, we have a look got a yeah. little clip of just before our infiltration of bohemian grove so we were told that the way to get into bohemian grove alex had this idea to rent a boat moor it climb up the mountain and get in that way Okay. So we met a local lawyer called Rick who said, if you go in that way, you're going to get yourself killed. And Alex wrote down, going in that way, dash, killed. Um, <laughs> we said, how do we do it? He said, just walk up the drive, just buy some preppy clothes, and walk up the drive, give them the security guard a kind of I rule the world wave. Right, so, so you th you therefore look like you were, yeah, yeah, a member of parliament from somewhere. Yeah, there's like a thousand people there, just walk up the drive, dress right. preppy, yeah. and just look like you belong. So we went to the local Eddie Bauer preppy clothes store and Alex bought some preppy clothes. <laughs> Honestly, went into the dressing room looking like some sort of far-right wing Texan redneck nut and came out looking like Jay Gatsby. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a clip of Alex and his producer Mike practising being preppy so we could infiltrate a secret club where Henry Kissinger was rumoured to have a mock human sacrifice. We're just going to walk normally as we would. Calmly, la la la. There's gonna be guys sitting there, and we're, you know, we're fat cats. So let's go ahead. But uh, seriously, David, as fast as microprocessors are starting to move, it's getting down to a molecular level. The question is, at what level will just the actual basics of science stop us from making these these systems smaller? And I'm, it's the entire nanotechnology revolution that I find to be most dynamic. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Might, <Convincing. laughs> well, guess what? Well, so Alex, the more verbose one, became the world's leading conspiracy talk show host. Yeah. But guess what happened to Mike Hansen? Yeah. Well, I only know this because I visited Alex Jones in 2016 <laughs> and he told me, uh, Mike Hansen uh, um, inherited some land from his father, struck oil, became the richest man in his county, used the money to build an Alex Jones museum, like in the middle of nowhere in Texas, <laughs> and the centerpiece of this museum, and you can see it online, it's right there, is that shirt. <laughs> 
that he's now got like encased in purse specs because that was the shirt he wore when he infiltrated Bohemian Grove. <laughs> oh with, my goodness. Because what we saw when we got into Bohemian Grove was that. What I mean, that, they we weren't wrong? That's a, that's a photo. I don't know where that photograph comes from. We got a very grainy version of that footage. It was an actual, yeah, yeah. It was a stupid, like, Midsummer Night's Dream type pageant that they put on. Um, where they do, you know, get this human thing and throw it in the belly and it goes, ah, ye shall not burn me. And, and then they go, we shall burn thee tonight. For, um, it's, a, it's a show. It's a pageant. Okay. And Alex was like, this is actual human sacrifice. Right, okay, yeah. So he was taking it a bit far. But it's also, I mean, that's not very entertaining, is it? I mean, I suppose the fire's entertaining. I mean, the guys liked it. Uh, I was sitting amongst like a thousand men and they right. were like going like, burn him, burn him. Um, that's where I agree with Alex. Alex was like, there was a weird, intense atmosphere. And it was a little weird and intense. Is this the, is this the place where you kind of like, you saw like Peter Mandelson go in and all these other... No, that, that was, was the Bilderberg group. That's when uh, I got chased right, by different. the Bilderberg group. They didn't do that at Bilderberg group. Mm, no, they didn't. The Bilderberg group's much more sitting at a conference table and then playing golf. Okay. Uh, yes, that, I think that's what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah. No, the, what the ritual's about is um, we men of wealth and power come to this sylvan clearing in the forest. Glade. Glade. <laughs> yeah, at one point during the show, Alex never talks about this part. He talks about the human sacrifice part. But also, there was a man dressed in leaf-covered lederhosen singing a song about like oh leaves oh trees oh. and they had like members of the san francisco orchestra i mean if this was a cult for you know it's in service to moloch their owl god it was a pretty broad cult with you know members of the san francisco orchestra men in lederhosen uh and then, and then they bring out this effigy, you know, we shall burn thee tonight. You know, no, you won't. Yeah, we will. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> <laughs> and who organised it all? Who were the... The Bohemian Club. They oh, start in San okay. Francisco. They started it in the 1890s. That's quite San Francisco, is it? Now, you see, now yeah. I understand. You see that you get this shit at, you know, Yale and the Skull and Bones Club. There is a proclivity for elites to want to do weird rituals. That's like worthy. Masonic kind of thing. Yeah, that's worthy of reflection. Yes, that they like, want to show that they join that they're, they're joined. They're in a special. Club. Yeah. Yeah, they they have special secrets. Yeah, that no which one then gives them a mandate to feel superior to other people. Yeah, and and only talk to the same people as them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A bit like the Soho House. <laughs> <laughs> so look, <laughs> Alex Jones, I, th I feel like we should talk a little bit about Alex Jones because obviously he's now, um, you know, like, as you said, the kind of world's most famous conspiracy theorist. But I had, um, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, I think we should talk about him because he's, he's, he's kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And that is, I mean, that is partly to do with the, it was partly to do with him. Well, because he is charismatic, as you said, I mean, he's not. He doesn't do anything for me, but I can see that he's charismatic. Yeah, he's, but there's more to it than that. Like, yeah. like, you know, he aligned himself with Trump and Trump aligned himself with him and, you know, they fed off each other. Um, Alex gave Trump, I think, permission to be more conspiratorial and Trump gave Alex permission to be more xenophobic. And uh, actually, years later, I, uh, I met... Because my story about Alex sneaking to Bohemian Grove was kind of silly and fun and... Alex became much more malevolent and, and as I'm sure everybody knows, has now uh, had a billion dollar judgment against him for hounding the parents of children killed at Sandy Hook, yeah. saying it was a false flag operation and they were all actors. And people went off and, you know, hounded the parents, like chasing yeah. them down the street. Uh, anyway, I, I, I wanted to do a second story about Alex because I felt like, you know, I needed to, I don't know, Balance it out Balance because, it you've out got, because you've got so bad. Yeah. yeah. So I did this story about his teenage years. I discovered that at, at school he was, a, he was like the worst bully at school. Hmm. And, he would like, and he was a conspiracy theorist even at the age of 12. He'd run down the corridors yelling that he was Satan and that the headmaster was in league with the pool hall owner to spy on them for the DEA. And eventually he beat his friend Bubba almost to death over a girl. He still has, like, injuries. Goodness. And Bubba knows Alex intimately. And then when I met Bubba, I, I told him that um, Alex was now 
you know, an incredibly famous... Like, I, I assumed he knew mm. that Alex was an incredibly famous conspiracy theorist and that Trump was a fan, and Bubba didn't know, and it was, like, very awkward. And I'm, I've got a little clip of my conversation with Bubba. The fact is, he's carried on saying all of these crazy things, but it's no longer about the school or the pool hall. Now it's about the globalists and the Muslims. People believe him now, including the president. I mean, I mean, who's to say? I mean, I mean, some of the stuff he says could be true. It could be. I mean, uh, uh, Obama, he could be a Muslim. He could back the, the radical Muslims, and he could have been giving them money behind... I mean, who knows? You know, we don't know. I mean, we hear what they want us to hear, and we see what they want us to see, you know? I mean, anything could be anything, you know? I mean, how dispiriting. He, more than anyone, knows that Alex yeah. talks crap. But... Yeah. There's a thing, though, isn't there? Like, uh, the... I sometimes think it's very it's different in America than it is in in Britain but there's a sense generally that people don't want to be you know I can't think of any better way of saying it taking the piss out of so they 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 and if you think that essentially perhaps the government isn't always right then you are more when I think everybody probably thinks that then everybody is slightly predisposed to think well, they say that, but they don't mean it. You know, they say, you know, don't, you know, don't go out during COVID, but we're having a party. So, like, if yeah, you, oh god, yeah. If you if you believe that, then I understand why people might think that you you shouldn't believe in the kind of government. Yeah. Well, you get you always get renaissances of conspiracy theories when our leaders act in conspiratorial ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Iraq, the Iraq run up to the Iraq War is a very good example of that. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more and more interested in the mistakes that we make, like what we do to, to fuel all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've totally forgot what my next slide is. Can I have a little look? And then, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, I know what this is. Yeah. Okay. So, so one, of the th yeah, one of the things that we could talk about, and I think we will talk about with this, this, this slide, is um, the, there's a kind of... Um, increase in conspiracy theories uh, one can say yeah. there is, there's definitely an increase in theories you, you can think of QAnon but also actually um, I don't know if anybody knows about this that there was um, something that happened in Hampstead really quite recently where um, I know I know this because I heard a podcast about it of course and um, where um, essentially what happened was a parent accused other parents of um, sexual abuse of children. They put a list of names on the internet, which then went around everywhere and hit the American conspiracy theorists, and they all turned up on the doorstep of this completely innocent uh, school in Hampstead. Yeah. But they, what was interesting to me was they used the same kind of ideas. So the idea was child abuse, so children disappearing and paedophiles, um, kind of eating children, sucking their blood, and, and always yes. doing it somewhere like in a, a small... You know, like Pizzagate, there'd be like a, a small door that people go in and, and it all yeah. happens in there. And it's yeah. the same all the time. Well, that comes from, I mean, that comes from anti-Semitism. That's the blood libel. That's the idea that Jews would, you know, bake their bread with, with the blood of Christian babies. So that goes back to like the dawn of conspiracy theories. But it seems to be that absolutely that's the kind of stamp at everywhere now. It's, yeah. it's, it's completely nuts. And this, um, in your uh, podcast... The, the last one for BBC is Things Fell Apart. You look at the satanic panic, which is what that's from, isn't it? Yeah. So I think we should maybe talk about that. Yeah, it's extraordinary. It was in the early 80s. Um, and um, by the way, my collaborator on Things Fell Apart, I believe, is, is here tonight, Sarah Shebia, Sarah, who, who I worked, you know, it was very, the whole show was really me and Sarah just working incredibly intensely for a year. And, and a joyful year it was. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it, this happened in the early 80s. It starts with, Chris, it starts with like crazy Christian radio shows, uh, people claiming that they'd been like kidnapped by Satanists and had to take part in rituals. Yeah, one of the rituals was they were like, had to be like, like babies would have to be born through a horse or something. Yeah, passed through a horse, head to anus. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Very specific ritual. Yeah. Uh, you said we didn't make it up. <laughs> um, and, uh, but then it spread. And, and suddenly, like, uh, you know, the mainstream media, NBC, would, would be reporting on it, but not, like, listen to these crazy Christian Christians coming up with these crazy conspiracy theories, but they, like, sniffed money. 
So they're like, maybe it's true. So then there's suddenly all of these like proper news reports about how Satanists were infiltrating our children's minds through through the media, yeah, through through Judas Priest songs and uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then it turned into um, daycare centres, because this was when this was this was the the, the dawn of daycare centres. Like women were going out to work for the first time, dropping off their young children at daycare centres, feeling terrible about it, suspicious, guilty, yeah. ashamed. Then they'd go home, and then suddenly, you know, these rumours would start to spread about abuse happening. And then the cops would come in and the, and, the, and the police would say, well, you know, you, you obviously, you missed the signs of abuse. You missed the signs of abuse. And then they, then they felt so bad that like they'd been asleep and now they were awake. They became like, you know, fierce advocates for the prosecution. And into this came this lovely woman called Kelly Michaels, just a sweet woman who was suddenly like accused of, of playing jingle bells. And then, because the, the claims were like these... Daycare people would put bombs in hamsters and explode them in front of the class. I mean, nuts. All believed, like uncritically believed. Um, and Kelly was accused of, you know, playing jingle bells in the nude on the piano. This is in a, in a daycare centre in a church where people were going in, in and out all the time. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's the classic thing where, that where police or prosecutors would ask, this is what happened in the Hampstead case as well, they would ask children... And the children would gradually realise that if they said certain things, it would almost things would go better. Yeah. You know? So if you said yes, that's what happened. And also they were young kids, so they were kind of interested in poo. Yeah. You know, as kids are. And so exactly that becomes the thing. And so um, yeah, what's so interesting is that Kelly's daycare centre. I'm going to play you a little clip from Kelly. This always yeah. moves me. This clip. This is yeah. Kelly talking about at the end of, because she ended up she was she was um, convicted. She was sentenced to 47 years. 40, 47 years in jail. And the reason why she... If there's any heterodox people in the audience, you're going to enjoy what I'm about to say. Um, heterodox meaning sort of sceptical, centrist type people. Because the reason... So she was in jail for like four years. And then an older journalist called Dorothy Rabinowitz, who worked for Harper's magazine, went in there into Harper's and said, you know, I'm looking at the evidence against this woman, Kelly Michaels, and I think, I think it's kind of absurd. And she said all the younger journalists at Harper's were like, uh, left, you know, journalists from the left, were just outraged that she said that and just refused to believe it and, and turned her entirely into a folk devil. And that made Dorothy Binowitz all the more, you know, convinced that she wanted to investigate and she got Kelly out after four years. Yeah. I'm going to play a short clip of Kelly after she was out. That was the huge turn that went from parents to say, I know my child, there's no way this could have happened and I wouldn't have known about it, to, oh, you know, I really... That's the wrong clip. We might have to just not show that clip. That it's, was it, the that huge, huge turn. To say, it's all going to be chaotic if I keep pressing buttons. <laughs> Let's just, it's a sad clip. The show's yeah. online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, know, I actually remembered the clip, and what, what happens in the clip is that she... You know, I can find the clip. Yeah, you can find um, it. Come on, John. I want to apologise. Like, you can now see everything on my laptop. You know, one time I did this, and everybody <laughs> can see everything on my laptop. Yeah, they've, they've, they've tastefully faded yeah. it. Do you know what one of them... really bad. I know, but do you know what? This was at Yale in front of, like, a thousand students, and do you know what one of the folders said? Forbidden animal love. <laughs> That's the one we want you to click on, John. <laughs> my son was... You don't need to know. <laughs> it was a school project of my son doing Romeo and Juliet. Uh, but you know what? It's already two minutes to eight, so I think we shouldn't show this clip. I OK, that's fine. On. I mean, it's, it's, but basically, what I can, I can kind of summarise it. And what happens is that she, she goes... It's completely trumped up, the whole thing. It's completely trumped up. She goes down for 47 years. And then is eventually uh, comes out after four years because of the work of this journalist and uh, another lawyer. Yeah. But the thing that really mm -hmm. breaks her heart. I've made friends over the years. Okay, here we there go. it is. That's good. Yeah. Can we have this back? Thank you. I've made friends over the years, and when people say, "Oh, so tell me you about yourself. Where did you go to college?" and I dread this moment when I meet new people. I survived the story. I survived it, but it's still horrible to have to say the words. I was accused of abusing children. It's always painful. It'll always hurt. It'll always be. I'm getting emotional on how I'm talking about it because it, because it's so it's unjust and yet I can't do anything about it. It's woven into my story. It's who I am, and that I lived through it. That I was that person, 
So I've made many friends over the years, but it's always been the very painful. They sit with their mouth hanging open. What? Because I'm this nice little church lady. You know, I have, I have a bunch of kids and I, uh, you know, I at social events. I think, what? You were in prison? So it never ceases to be very painful. And the people who got her in prison weren't like, you know, sort of rednecks from, you know, they were liberal lawyers, accountants. As Kelly says, you know, we're all, we are all prone to, to these moral panics. And it's something that we do every day on Twitter. Yes, very true. I think yeah. we do. We, um, yeah. So look, I'm, I'm conscious, I'm, I've got a little time thing. I'm conscious of time, but there is a little bit that um, I'd like to go through before we throw it. I'm going to say it, throw it open to the audience. Think of your questions. Um, so, uh, but I, what I'd like to um, talk to you a little bit about is about that kind of idea of prejudice. So the, we all bring our own prejudices to whatever situation it is. And I know that you wanted to kind of... Un pick that a little bit around the idea of um, a recent court case that we could talk about, but let, let what we bring, what we believe into a situation, and yeah. we automatically uh, kind of do as much as we can to bolster what our beliefs, don't we? Yes. Well, I think I'm seeing, I'm seeing a rise of conspiratorial thought on the left. Which is a bit similar to the satanic panic, then. Yeah, it? it is, it is. Uh, I think in, in terms of like the crazy QAnon stuff on the right, I think, we're, I think we've hit rock bottom when it comes to that and we're coming out the other side. And the reason why I say that is, firstly, the election deniers were roundly uh, defeated in the American midterm elections. Yeah. Uh, so all the people Trump was, was promoting uh, did very poorly. Uh, I think Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter is, is you know, people... People rightly think it's just, you know, they don't want this shit. No, you know, when, when Elon Musk tweeted that grotesque conspiracy theory about Nancy Pelosi's wife, Paula, like, we knew what to do. That advertisers... Yeah. There wasn't that frightening feeling of, like, I don't know what's going to happen next. Like, we knew what to do with someone like that. So I feel we've, we've hit rock bottom when it comes to that stuff. You know, millions of Trump voters touched the stove and realised how hot it was. Yeah. But I think while we've been looking at all of that stuff, there's been a rise of conspiracy theories coming from the left more. OK. And um, what would you use as an example for that? Well, I've got... I mean, I've got a number of examples. I think I'll... This doesn't completely answer the question. Yeah. What, what I'm noticing more and more... I'm going to talk more in sort of vagaries about this. Yeah. Um, what I'm noticing more and more... Look, we've all had that experience of, like, picking up a quality publication, uh, quoting experts and it happens to be about something we have special knowledge of and just being dismayed by all the errors. And yeah. more and more, I'm noticing that the errors are all in one direction, which is to make the group we don't like seem even worse than we already thought that they were. Which is quite trickery. Yeah, and it's, and it's absolutely seeped into the mainstream media. Um, particularly, I'm talking <coughs> particularly in America. Right. Um, and now, you know, these, these sort of journalists... And, and academics who are striving for high ideological excellence over factual evidence. I, right. I think that's happening more and more. Um, so it's like to, it's, that's also a bit kind of trickery, isn't it? So it's a bit like being pure. It's almost like being pure of thought before looking for the looking for the actual yeah. facts. And not really caring about the facts because yeah. you know when 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 we fill our heads with ideology, other things just don't matter as much. But but for me, I I, I personally would love a world, I'm, you know, this is the world, I'm not being all, you know, this is the world we live in. We live in a world where there's lots of different types of journalism. There's activist journalism, there's, there's humanist journalism, like the kind of thing I do, where, where you just try and understand from every angle why people behave the way that they do. Then there's just objective journalism. Yeah. And I think it's, it's great to have a world where all of these different sorts of journalism um, keep each other honest, yeah. right? And, and work all in, in, in tandem with each other. What I don't like is the possibility that one type of journalism will, will then kind of subsume the other types, like, like a battle between different types of journalism, uh, and where the kind of journalism that I do is sort of suddenly rendered, like, suspicious. Do, right. do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, we had years of kind of a, a certain type of journalism, which is, you know, essentially, I think in Britain anyway, a kind of um, BBC type of journalist or, or, or journalism or... I would say, which is like, you know, these are the facts and this is one side and this is the other side and, you know, we are, but the facts are this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that what's interesting is that the, the rise of um, the other approach actually has seemed much more successful. So you look at something like Brexit, you know, 
uh, for instance, uh, you know, kind of um, radio stations like LBC shot through the roof because of Brexit. Yeah. So yeah. And opinionated journalism worked really well. And a lot of BBC journalists have left the BBC because they want to have, be able to express their opinions. Right. Well, I mean, I'm, I've got a different thing to say, yeah. which is that I noticed... Um, Look, I live in the countryside now, and the only thing to do in the afternoons when you finished work, other than smoke weed, is to watch the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. And <laughs> I, 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 I kind of watched it all, and I watched. I started late, so I could fast forward the sidebars. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody else did that. Did anybody else do that? Like just watch the trial in a in a bubble. People work in like. Right. <laughs> I start, well, I start work at like 5 a.m., so by 2 p.m. I'm happy to watch yeah. Johnny and Amber. Well, look, watching that trial uh, the way that I did, which was just watching the case unfold without any commentary, um, you know, you, you agree with the, with the jury, like you agree that, um, that um, you, you agree with the jury. And then, uh, and, and you think there's not a jury in the land that would have come up with a different result that's very interesting and then you saw these editorials now you see these editorials sort of basically saying well the thing that really and i thought this was like a big moment um that there was a a lot of people watched that trial and then would go onto these like youtube channels that were run by lawyers and the lawyers would then dissect in a very lawyerly way uh what had happened in the trial, and it was like watching an expert, you know, in an yeah. objective way. And then after the verdict came out, and some people didn't like the verdict, yeah. there was like there was a an editorial in the Washington Post, which attacked the lawyers on YouTube, who were the ones who were actually giving people what they wanted. That's amazing, isn't it? That's the but, expert thing. Yeah, the mainstream media failed, didn't cover it, didn't realise that millions of people were watching it. People were just watching it on YouTube, like, without any filter, just watching it unfold, listening to these lawyers who were being very sensible. And then you had, like, a grieved columnist in the Washington Post attacking the lawyers. Yeah, that's interesting, because yeah. they had done... Yeah, I mean, it's interesting for me... Yeah, because well, sort of treating the lawyers like they weren't you know, reliable, they weren't to yeah. be trusted, they were just trying to make a buck out of the trial. Yeah, that they weren't doing the... Yeah. They, actually, they weren't the experts. It felt to me that there was a massive disconnect between, like, the quote-unquote legacy media and what they thought people were thinking about that trial and what people were actually thinking from watching the trial in the way that trials should be watched, just objectively. Yeah, so you feel that the mainstream... Universal comes, I hate saying the mainstream media because it makes me think of Trump, the MSM, but, like, the, the mainstream media did failed. Mm. And not only did they fail, but then they attacked the people who succeeded. Yeah. The, the, the legal... You, you know, I, 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 I kind of really understood in that moment why people were kind of drifting away from our sorts of media to... to but just, they, Robbie Williams said to me one time, uh, I only watch YouTube now. Yeah, well, that's... And I think that's a prescient... Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, because people watch YouTube or TikTok, don't they? Yeah, they want YouTube because they don't want to be... They don't want their news filtered by people they think are biased and actually are quite biased. And I think our media, CNN and so on, you know, spent the last five years offering the world a heavily curated version of the news, which is a form of lying. Yes, that... Yeah, that's... Yeah, oh, good, that's interesting, because it goes against that Brexit thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, but I yes, would exactly. Say I think... Both, uh, yeah. It's a bit of both. I would say, personally, I did not watch that trial, but I was always on Amber's, Amber's side because I'm a feminist, so I was always taking her side. But then I know people who watched the trial as you did, yeah. said, you're wrong. <laughs> I, I had dinner with an old school friend in Cardiff the other night, and he um, said that you know, he felt the same way that you did, and then it was his 16-year-old daughter who said, no, you're wrong. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. Mm. While all of this happened, something else happened as well, which is that you've got men you know, all over America beating up their girlfriends and saying, yeah. you're just like Amber Heard. Yeah. So a huge amount of violent misogyny came from it as well. Yeah. Course. But yeah. hey, that happens, you know, with the football. Um, right, OK, so I'm aware that we've kind of like got a certain amount of time. All that's left is Frank and a little clip, but I could, we, we could do... always open up to questions and maybe end with that. Should we do that? Hello, I'd like to see you all. Can we have the lights up and then we can see everyone? Because I bet they're dead good looking. Can we have the lights up? You could do that. Yeah, and then we can see you <laughs> yeah. a little bit. Does it, oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, hey. there you are. Hello. I hope you've enjoyed it thus far. <laughs> yes. um, I'm oh, oh that's you. nice. Oh, that's lovely. So, look, 
I'm going to put my specs on so I can see a bit better. Uh -huh. um, and um, we're going to ask the questions to you. And also, I've got, I think, maybe questions on here, if it works, because there are people watching online and they can send questions yeah, to you. Yeah, hello, people at home. Oh, uh, yes, hello, people at home. Um, so, let's have a question. So who has a question? You want to put, I mean, in this room. So put your hands up. Oh, there's one there. Yeah. Hi. 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 Is that working? Yeah. yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just had a question. So, um, as you've made sort of like video documentaries, audio documentaries, books, is there a format you prefer? And how does it affect your ability to get access? Like, do you find it easier to get someone to be in a book or on a podcast compared to TV? To be honest, access doesn't really, like, isn't, isn't impacted, that, that I can remember. Uh, in terms of, I mean, the most fun, I think, is, is audio, is podcasting. Like, I, I really enjoy collaborating with, with, you know, Sarah or whichever producer I'm working with. And, and, um, and it's fun and easy. Like, the hardest but the best is books. Uh, and I think after, after season, I'm making season two of Things Fell Apart at the moment, and, and, I'm, and I'm starting to write a book. And I, and I kind of think once that's done, it's, I'm going to just cut, try and just keep writing books because, you know, they're insanely hard. And there's, there's a reason why years go by between writing books. It's because, you know, it's, it's you know, kill you. It pulls your intestines out of your mouth <laughs> uh, writing a book. Um, it's long, isn't it? Books are long. And just so hard. You just come out of your room at the end of each day, just like that. Ah, and also, you want... can't tell anybody. So you come out of your room yeah. like that, and they're like, what have you been doing? You're like... Yeah. Right and of course, in. you know, if you're sitting <laughs> on your own in a room, you forget that there's like an audience out there who might... You, you know, you're just some twat sitting alone in a room <laughs> thinking he can write a book. <laughs> I've learned nothing. Like, I've learned nothing from the books that I've written. Each yeah. time, I'm, I'm starting from scratch. Yeah, it's a terrible way to spend time. Yeah. So don't write books. Yeah. Other than that, fine. <laughs> but, yeah, so I'm going to really try and write, write more books now. <laughs> um, OK, another question. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Hello. Hi, John. Hello. Um, you've spoken a lot tonight about the sort of negative side of Twitter, social media, that sort of thing. Um, I'm intrigued to know your stance on whether you think there are good sides of social media, whether there's a benefit to humankind. Oh, I mean, most totally. Uh, and in fact, you know, when people thought a week, week or two ago that Twitter was about to collapse, it's like that, you know, uh, Joni Mitchell song, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And you're suddenly thinking about all the things that you're going to lose, the friendships, the funniness. You know, people, you meet them in real life and, and uh, they're so anxious that they've got selective mutism. And then on Twitter, they're funny and a bane and... Um, so Twitter, you know, was, gave a voice to voiceless people in many different ways. And, I, um, and yeah, all that, if, it, if Twitter does go down, all that's going to go down too. Not to mention how good it is at, it is at breaking news and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, yeah, there's, there's much to love. Yeah. Okay, another question. I would feel like I should look over here. Come on, this side. Put your hands yeah. up. And if not, we've got some more stuff. Oh, yeah, right down the middle. Oh, hi. Yeah, hello. Hang on, are you coming down? Nice hi. one in pink jumper. Oh. oh, look at that. Lovely jumper. Yeah. This lady here. It's a nice amble. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening. I think we've been really quiet whilst you've been talking, but I think we really have really appreciated you and listened to oh, you. And that's so nice. that's, that's a comment, not a question. Thank um, you. Earlier on in your career, you said you spent a whole year with this person, or you were you know, a whole year with that person. That's such a huge part of your life, and it takes it over. How do you come out of that and still be you? Because that's such a commitment, and the same with writing books. You've got to research it and live something in such a way. That's a real investment. How do you come out of that? Yeah, it's true, and especially when it's... Well, I remember, like, there's weird... When my son was young, it would be really weird. Like, I'd be at a... I'd be at a jihad training camp on the Wednesday, and then at Legoland on the Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that would help. Um, <laughs> To be honest, like, I love, I mean, I hate, I, like, I hate travel and meeting people. And I, I, so, you know, it's being out of my comfort zone. But I also love, you know, amassing material and going off and having adventures. And so I can go back home and make it work as a piece of writing. I, I, you know, I mean, the honest answer is, like, I don't enjoy the going out and getting the material, mainly because I'm, I'm, I'm old and anxious and I have all sorts of anxiety disorders and, and um, 
But I, I just love what I do so much. I love having gathered the material, and then I go home, and, and I start to sculpt it and put it in the perfect order, and it can take months. And honestly, a week of being out of my depth, having some scary adventure, then equals several months at home making it work as a story. So, you know, Louis Theroux was asked the question, like, why do you do it? And, and his answer was, because not doing it is worse. And, and I think that's true. So actually, the answer is, like, you know, I remember when I lived in, back in London, I, my doctor, Dr. Spate, had seen a documentary I'd made with David Icke the night before on Channel 4, and I went to see her. And she kind of said, oh, you know, your life is so stressful, and, you know, with all of these dangerous, scary people, you know, it must be having a terrible impact on your mental health. And I was, like, looking at her thinking, no, I just, I love it. Like, <laughs> um, and the fact is, I love it. Like, I love, I get all, I asked Randy Newman, like, why do you write songs? And he said, because it's how I judge myself and how I feel better. And I, I can't think of another way of feeling better than, than, writing, than doing these stories. It's the, it's the thing I love more than anything in the world, especially now my son's grown up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, another question. Hello. Hi. Um, I just had a question about, like, you spoke briefly about the different types of journalism. I was wondering whether you think there is, like, a role for, like, act activist journalists, or whether you would rather have journalism uh, be in the more BBC present the facts. Uh, facts no, style. I think there's a great role for activist journalism. And, and, I, and I think, you know, the kind of activist journalism that we've seen over the last six or seven years has been kind of extraordinary. And it's taught, you know, I'm, uh, you know we, we're not old stubborn fucks, are we? They aren't going to learn from you. Um, no, we're not. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's taught me stuff. I, I certainly felt that... Um, that I'd spent my career thinking about flawed situations instead of flawed systems, and that's something yeah. that, I, that I learnt. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think it needs to adhere to like proper journalistic standards, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I don't think it always does, and I think that's, that's the problem. And also sometimes it's like a kind of uh, lobbying thing, isn't it? That's the idea, is that, the idea that there's a, something that you need to think about, mm. so we're just going to tell you you need to think about it over and over until you think about it, and then that's, that's the... That's the deal. It's that's that's the point. Yeah. And that's how things rise to the top of the agenda. If it, if people keep talking about it. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So yeah. So the answer is like absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I do. Yeah. Okay. Come on, this side, right yeah. at the back. And there's people in the middle now. There's I've, all sorts. I've got this microphone here, so I'm going to ask. Well, right, who's, oh yeah, um, there. <laughs> all right, you ask the question. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, two two things. First one is I'm just wondering whether you. Uh, read the judgment from the defamation case against Johnny Depp, again, that the judge put out in the UK, mm. which was absolutely amazing. I kind of sort of challenge anybody to read that and not think that he was guilty of all those things. Mm. And the second thing is I wondered how you feel about somebody like um, Russell Brand, who now has six million followers on YouTube and in some ways has become the mainstream himself, yet is very curated in the news that he gives and in, in many ways feels very, very biased, and I wondered whether you had a view on that. Well, I mean, it would be a little unfair for me to comment on, comment on Russell Brand because, like, you know, I'm, I'm aware of, of his kind of shift and other people's shift. Like, I'm a, <laughs> I know I was really laughing the other day because I've, I've recently discovered Van Morrison, like... Oh, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, like... Uh, Popular Ast fellow. <laughs> yeah, Ast Astral Weeks, like, passed me by until what? last April. And, I, and it's like I heard it for the first time, and I'm like, oh my God, this is like the greatest album like ever. <laughs> and then I was like in the garage, like a, a, where I live upstate, and it was coming out of like the tinny speakers, and I thought, people know these songs? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I've just, and I, and I listened to it over and over, and just recently I started to think, well, I'm going to listen to some later Van Morrison now. And later Van Morrison was all like, on March 20th, 2020, the government said this. <laughs> and then, dum -ba -dum -ba -dum, but then uh, two weeks later, they said this. Dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Yeah. <laughs> not quite as jolly. No, no it's not a sweet thing. Uh, so, so, and there is this kind of extraordinary shift with a lot of people in a way that I, I you know, I find dispiriting that, that um, you know, people banding together and getting more and more and how popular it is. It's, it's, it's dispiriting. At the same time, like I've been on, when I went on Russell Brand's show a few years ago, it, it wasn't like that. It was, a, it was, it was, a, it was fun. So I, so I don't want to like diss Russell without really having watched, listened to much of his stuff, because I had good experience with him a few years ago. Yeah. Um, 
And the, the Dorian Amber thing, look, I mean, look, I, I don't think this is, it's right for us to be getting into the minutiae of, of like, you know, the UK case versus the US case and the different evidence that came in, I and mean, it will swallow up the rest of the evening. Um, all, all I can say is that if you watch the American trial, I think it would be very hard to watch the American trial and not come away thinking that, 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 that the evidence... Um, led to the conclusion. Led to the conclusion, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting with Russell Brand, isn't it? Because I think it's, it's almost like it, it, it's like somebody that has discovered an area where people are interested, isn't it? So that, that could be, I don't know, you could do it about trainers if you're interested in trainers. But he's found his niche. And I think there's lots of people like that that, that find their niche and then find their audience. And, and then go further and further. It's a bit like Alex Jones, isn't it? So you get more and more into that because your audience want more and more of the same thing. And that's understandable on all levels, but it's whether, it's again, I suppose, whether it's true or not. Yeah. I <laughs> I, across the political spectrum, um, facts are being eschewed for high ideological excellence. Yeah. But I think sometimes because fact-checking departments are, like me, kind of come from the left, there can sometimes be less of an appetite to fact-check. Yeah, when, well, when yeah, and also, actually, to be honest, as speaking as a working journalist, quite often there aren't so many people employed to Who get actually fact-checking, yeah. Yeah, especially in Britain. I remember working for an American magazine after, uh, for, for a British magazine. The fact-checkers were unbelievable. They'd phone you up at 10.30 at night and go, did he really eat potato salad? And you'd yeah. go... Yeah. 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 I mean, they're like their fact checking in America is fantastic. You can be, but it, it, also what happens though when you fact check that heavily in America is that your your voice goes through the deauthorizing yeah. machine when suddenly it just doesn't read like a like you anymore. Yeah, it, it's, it can be a bit glum. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't write. I mean, I love those magazines, like the mag, the heavy fact checking magazines in America, but I don't work for them for that reason. No. There's then, no jokes. Yeah, they're not interested in people's voices. There was a line, you know, uh, the New York Times magazine excerpted my book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, and they kept in a line, like a joke, where I say, I go to, like, this old museum where I'm looking through, like, the ancient American legal books, and I say, and I'm, like, rifling through them, like, the earliest court documents, and I say, for the first hundred years in America, all that happened, as far as I could tell, was that people named Nathaniel purchased land near rivers. Um, <laughs> and the New York Times magazine kept it in. And people have said to me subsequently, like, you were so lucky that they kept that line <laughs> yes. OK, come on, this side. Yes, it's somebody in the back. Oh, you keep picking. I'm going to go this side. Right, in the middle. You know, I'm that's glad fine. you're Please doing this. Do. I'm terrible at that. And then I'm, we're going to go that side. And then we're going to go this side. Okay. So be warned. Thank you both very much. Um, on social media, the US's current affairs and politics are just so dominant. Um, do you think that spotlight is deserved, or is there another country or culture whose happenings you'd much rather see? Um, well, OK, so when Trump got elected, I, I just... Um, I wanted to find like-minded, aghast people. So I went to CNN and just spent four years watching, you know, brilliant monologues by Anderson Cooper and Jake Tapper and Aaron Burnett, and they were just telling me in a vain way everything that I was thinking, that Trump was a, you know, was, was a uniquely terrible failure. Mm. And after four years of that, he nearly won a second term. Mm. And I thought, you know, I've been a willing participant in receiving a heavily curated version of the news these four years. How different was that to QAnon? Maybe I was in QAnon, but my Q was Anderson Cooper. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that, that gave me pause. And, and, but when Liz Truss got elected, I shifted wholesale to Radio 4 News. <laughs> <laughs> and, Absorbed it. Yeah, I go, where, I go where the craziness is. So... <laughs> <laughs> So um, you're quite happy to shift around. Yeah, yeah. I think it's true all the time, though, isn't it? It's all, always true that American news dominates and you're a bit like, there is other things going on. It's just that we understand them. Yeah, I see, so American news dominating over... over yeah. yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to say because I'm, I'm over there. But I could say that, like, you know, Americans were, in, were <laughs> enjoying with horror the whole... Boris Liz Trust thing just as much as Brits were. Like, <laughs> there, it was a big talking point in America, the whole Liz Trust Boris stuff. Yeah. Okay. Great, we won. <laughs> um, okay, yes, this side. Oh, look at this, you see. Now everyone's got that. Oh, and up. by the way, like, everyone in America was jealous. Like, you can get rid of a leader. Of <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> One of the biggest shocks about living in America is how fragile democracy seems in America, much more so than in Britain. Meaning? 
Well, like gerrymandering, voter suppression. Um, like I know gerrymandering happens here, but, or has happened in Northern Ireland, certainly, but yeah. nowhere near to the extent that it happens in America. Um, democracy in America feels like a game, feels like a, a game that people manipulate. Democracy in this country feels a lot stronger, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Right, reassured. Okay, yes, next question. Um, we're going to go, yes, this one here. Hello. Hi, John. Um, Hi. I think in terms of uh, someone in the public eye managing to turn around their, uh, how they're perceived in society, Matt Hancock in I'm a Celeb, and I'm not expecting you haven't watched right. I'm a Celeb, but I find it absolutely fascinating that prior to him going into the jungle, he's perceived as public enemy number one, and yet he came in third place, and it's almost almost like a fast-track way to public redemption, and I'm, like, I'm really curious to know what your, your thoughts are on that in terms of right. how the public now perceive him. Well, to me, I didn't watch I'm a Celebrity, I, and I was a bit jealous, because I would have. If I was living in this country, I would have watched it like every night. Uh, so I can't, so I don't, so I, yeah, I was surprised because on Twitter everyone was saying like, this is terrible, he should be dragged out of the jungle, and then he came third. So I did notice that. But, but it's again, it's that humanising effect, isn't it, obviously? So like you see, you see him and it, it, there's a kind of frisson that he's allowed, allowed, does that sound right? But he's allowed on our, our screens to do that because he should be obviously representing his political constituents. And then once he's there, what, you know, initially basically what happened is he just got given all the terrible tasks and then he was a bit boring, wasn't he? So the people just felt a bit sorry for him, so he got up to the, the third, but he wasn't interesting enough to win, which, you know, you can imagine him making a career of... He's doing SAS... That SAS one, Heroes, or whatever, he's doing that next. Mm. So he's just going to be a re reality contestant, I think. Sorry, everyone. It's yeah. going to be Matt Hancock from now on. Hooray. Yeah. So, look, I, th I know that you've got... Um, a well, there's two more things I wanted to do. Yeah. Before we why not? Well, thank you for those questions. Well, we should but give John's the audience the things he wants to do. Well, we could either like carry on with questions, or I could. I, could I think we should show a bit of Frank, Frank and then yeah. Oh, and then my little. Okay, I've got two other things lined up that I thought I'd show you. Yeah, cool. Um, well, yeah, I came back. I, I showed my film Frank. I, I co-wrote with Peter Straw the film Frank a few years ago, and which is like a fictionalized version of my years with Frank Sidebottom and, and, I, and I came across my old Frank Sidebottom slideshow, so I thought I'd just... This so maybe only makes sense to people who are from, as we are, from Manchester. Frank Sidebottom the, the wore a big age. fake head. Yeah, exactly, Timperley. Yeah. Timperley, yeah, he wore a big fake head that he never took off. Uh, he, oh, that's not Almost him. all of them. Oh, that's my... Oh, here we go. Here's There's Frank. Frank. OK. I've got to have my way now, baby. All I know is that it's good. You look like you're fun to me. I opened up my loving arms and watch out, cause here I come. You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, right round, right round. You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, right round, right round. You know you do, you really do. Thank you. Frank. It is mesmerising. I, I was in his band. Um, there I am. Back. Um, nothing makes a young man feel more alive than driving up the M6 at three in the morning, sitting next to a man wearing a big fake head. <laughs> and he doesn't. He never takes it off, does he? Well, for long periods he didn't take it off, and you couldn't call him um, Chris, which was his real name, until he took the head off. Yeah. He would shyly move away to take the head off, and I, I would look, and he had a nose peg that was digging in so much it like had deformed his nose and he would like take the head off and then take the nose peg off and wince in pain yeah being frank was painful um <laughs> this is me with uh, mike the manager um anyway i drifted like um th they fired me for tax reasons <laughs> uh, he owed thirty thousand pound tax and he still so been he right. couldn't afford you. Well, yeah, yeah, he couldn't afford us anymore, even though he was only paying me £40 a night. But he stood up in court and the judge said, you owe a lot of money, uh, do you have a payment plan? And he said, would a pound a week suffice, my lud? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, it would not. So he fired me and then 20 years later got back in touch and said he, and said he was putting the band back together. Amazing. I know, I'd, and then he said, but, and I would like, would you write something in The Guardian about it? So he didn't want me to be in the band again. <laughs> but he said... Um, he said that he'd had some new publicity photos done and age hadn't withered him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Doesn't he look good? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's barely, barely changed. And, I, and then I started writing a film um, 
with Peter Straw, sort of a, a, a sort of fictionalised version of the story. And during that, he he um, uh, he, he got cancer. And one of the last things he did was draw a picture of Frank Sidebottom having done chemotherapy. Aww. And then okay. uh, he, he, he died while we were still writing the film. Mm. And the Manchester Evening News said he was going to be buried in a pauper's grave. Um, so we sent out yeah. one tweet. Yeah. And within hours, we'd raised that £25,000, uh, which frankly was enough to bury and then exhume him and then... <laughs> <laughs> Several times. Um, I don't know if that is what they spent the money on. And then they made a sculpture of Frank. It was forged in the Czech Republic um, and was erected outside the dry cleaners in Timperley. Which is definitely yeah. the right place for it to be. Yeah, and they sent me a photo of the sculpture on its way from the Czech Republic. I love this picture so much. Because I think in this picture, Frank looks like he's been disturbingly kidnapped, but is fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, then the, and then the great unveiling. Yeah. Oh, oh, great. Anyway, I wanted to show you that. I just found it and I thought it'd be nice to show Yeah, you. I love Frank. I mean, I remember him, he, he, uh, I once went to the Hacienda before the Hacienda was into rave and they did a fashion show and it was, he was the host. Right. And they would just, somebody would walk past him like in a very unusual top and stuff like that. And he'd go, oh, look, it looks like the Newcastle strip. <laughs> <laughs> he Frank. was absolutely brilliant. I actually performed in them at the Shaw Theatre when it was in a different part of town. Amazing. Yeah, and, and I fell over on stage, tried to kick a football. Uh, Hello, you don't, well, you don't do anything fancy on stage, yeah. do you really? So I thought we could, no, I thought if you wanted to end with, I've got, I've got a little clip, I'm making a new show. Yes, let's have that. And I've Come got on. a tiny clip. This is, a, this is an unveiling of, of, the, of a show that I've nearly finished and it'll be out at some point, maybe next spring. And can I tell you the first line? It's, it's called The Debutante. And the first line of it is, this is the story of a debutante. I won't say where she's from because I don't, I, I want to try and keep some of it sort of private still. Yeah. This is the story of a debutante who as a result of a series of unlikely and often very bad life choices she made in the 90s, found herself in the midst of one of the most terrible crimes ever to happen in America. So who's going to not want to That sounds great. Because we've all made terrible decisions in the 90s, but, but we haven't ended up there. <laughs> so I thought I'd play like a one-minute clip of one of her first bad life choices. Excellent. OK, this is very early from episode one. Um, so she's just come back from Colorado, and she's a, uh, she's a, she's a former debutante uh, from high society, but, you know, she's lashing out a little bit, and she's at a party, and she meets a guy, like a young stoner drifter called Greg, and after three weeks, she uh, says, let's get married. So they drive to Vegas and get married, oh. and then he meets her parents, uh, and it doesn't go well because <laughs> she, they, wanted her, they wanted her to marry a squire from the debutante ball, not a stoner drifter, Greg. Yeah. Greg was just delightful, but they were a very troubled duo. So I'm going to play you a very short clip of uh, after they'd been married three weeks, she announced to Greg that there was something that she wanted them to do. She wanted to get a tattoo. And she, wanted, she, wanted her, she, she wanted her swastika. What Carol wanted specifically was for her and Greg to get matching swastika tattoos, very large ones on their arms, as big as Nazi armbands. We got outlines that night of it, and it looked horrible the next morning. I went to the bathroom and looked in the mirror, and I'd seen what I had done to myself, and I tried to scrub the damn thing off. Mm-mm, wasn't coming off. I went to work and I showed a guy and he's like, oh my God, what did you do? I was like, yeah, I know, oh my God. My, you know, my wife talked me into it. <sighs> Stupid, but... <laughs> as, as drunken mistakes go, getting a massive swastika tattooed on your arm is a pretty big one. That is a really stupid move on my part. <laughs> Greg's had his swastika tattoo covered over now. He's disguised it with little swirls and flowers, which, to be honest, makes it look like an effeminate swastika. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's a very small clip of the first of many twists and turns in Carol's life. Great. Uh, very good. Yay, so that's it.
So look, mm. so look I'd just like to say um, uh, thank you for being a really uh, fantastic audience. I'd also like to say hi to Greg Stackelman because he really wanted to come. And, oh, the man uh, who fell. So I'm just going to say that. Um, yeah. But also, uh, John will be signing books in the, the bar area, I believe. It's called the, fo the, foyer, the foyer. But I'd like to say thank you for being a fantastic audience and thank you to the wonderful John Ronson. Yay!